Hello. <laughs> Is anybody there? I'm Susan Woodcock and um, welcome to my hangout today. I own HomeDeckGal.com and this was an impromptu um, webinar that I decided to do on Wednesday after I had um, posted fixed pictures of the shade that I'm going to show today. I used a different method than usual for adding the ribs. So while I was um, making the shade, I took pictures as I normally do and um, thought that, you know, somebody might be interested. So I've had a really good response and um, I want to thank you for joining me for the Hangout today. I did enable questions. I don't know if um, I'm going to check that and see if there's any Q&A. Uh, the Hangouts are live, so um, I'm kind of um, having to do a little checking on things before we get started to make sure to make sure that it's working and um, from my end everything looks great so I'm just going to hope that you can see the um, webinar and if you want to participate and you have the questions pane open go ahead and type in some questions or just say hello it's um, really nice as somebody um, like many of you that works by themselves um, at home um, to connect in some way and um, you know I actually got up and uh, got dressed and put on a little lipstick this morning which I don't always do when I'm working from home so um, thank you again for joining me I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, presentation loaded so I'm going to um, scare the scare share the screen Well, thank you. Somebody says, "I, Jennifer, thank you very much. <laughs> so here comes, um, you should be seeing the um, slide presentation on your screen. And the title of our presentation today is Roman Shade with French Blackout and Ribs. Not a very creative title, but um, to the point. And um, I am presenting this live. So just a little um, public service <laughs> announcement before I get started. I'm showing one of the methods that I use um, when I'm making Roman shades. There are many different methods. There are many right ways. And I don't always use the same method every time. I don't always do the hems the same at the bottom. I don't always place the weight bar at the same place. I don't always use the same rings or the same lift system. It's wonderful to have so many options, but um, there isn't just one. So that's why I wanted to share with you today just one more technique that you can add to your arsenal of Roman shade sewing methods. We're starting with just the general um, project details. This will be a short webinar. It'll be, um, I think there's 20 slides, so this should last about 30 minutes. This um, is for one window. The finished size of the shade, which is outside mount, is 45 inches wide by 70 and 3 quarters inches long. And the face fabric is a cotton print called Katmandu from Home Accents Fabrics. It's a medium weight um, printed cotton. And then the materials and supplies used for this project. And I will have a resource list on the very last slide. So stay tuned for that. Face fabric, flannel interlining, and you can use white or natural. I'm using white here. Classic sateen and black. Classic sateen lining and ivory or white. I'm using ivory. Plastic shade ribs. And I'm using the ProLift shade system, and that comes with rings, the headrail, and all the components needed to complete the system. So because it's a kit, I'm not going to list out um, all of that here in the materials list. I'm using 1.4 millimeter shade cord, a flat metal weight bar, needles and thread for hand sewing, board, staple gun, and staples. So you see the... Um, Supply list, there really isn't anything um, that new or different. 
except maybe the lift system. That is a new system. So we're starting with the fabric cuts. Face fabric, finish length plus six inch allowance for the bottom hem and board mounting. Now I'm calling that a minimum allowance. When I'm cutting for draperies or shades, I hardly ever cut exact <laughs> what I need. Um, I usually add at least two inches and I call that a tabling allowance. You often hear it called a workroom allowance. It's just a little insurance. So I would go ahead and add another two inches to that in case you don't cut straight or you decide you want to shift the fabric a little bit or maybe maybe make a mistake in your math. So um, just add a little bit more if you would like to to the minimum allowance. For the width, you need to allow eight inches um, for your side hems, and that's two inch doubled side hems around the sides and the bottom. The lining and inner lining, you'll need to cut that the finished length plus two inch allowance for the board mount. And again, if you want to add a little bit more as a workroom allowance, that's fine. And then the width is going to be trimmed to fit when it's added to the shade. So don't waste any time at this point trying to cut the width perfectly. Um, I find it much easier to lay it out and cut it to fit the shade than to try to cut it perfectly now. So just cut your length, add a little extra, whack it off, fold it up, <laughs> and set it aside. <laughs> just get it all cut and off the table. Get the bolts off the table. So cut all your fabrics, set aside your linings, and now I'm going to show you how I'm hemming this shade. I do really like this technique. I like the way it looks, but um, as I said at the beginning of the program, that um, I don't always hem this way. Sometimes I have a double fold four inch or six inch hem at the bottom of the shade, depending on the size of the folds, whether it has trim at the bottom or not. So um, this is just one way, but I love the way this looks. So I wanted to share it with you. So I'm doing a mitered hem and it goes around all three sides, two inch doubled hem. So the first thing after your fabric is cut to the proper width um, and um, your length is to press a two inch doubled hem in the sides and the bottom edges all the way around with your iron and check as you're ironing in the side hems, just double check your width. Uh, just because you allowed four inches on each side uh, for your two inch doubled hem doesn't mean you're going to fold it over perfectly. So fold over that first fold, checking your width as you go. And this was 45 inches wide. So I only needed one width, one cut. And then fold over to get the double fold and then fold up the bottom hem as well. When you press in all your hems, you're going to get these great creases. And you can see on slide number three, see the creases that were created? I went to um, fold it in the mitered corner after I folded in all the side hems at two inches double. And then in slide two, I folded in that miter and gave it a good press. Then to slide three, I opened it up. See all those um, fold lines? Those are going to be your stitch lines for, um, whoops, I have a touchy mouse here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Did I wake you up? <laughs> I switched to a wireless mouse and, and it has a mind of its own. So anyway, in picture three, you can see that you have crease lines for um, a guideline for sewing your miter. In slide uh, or photo four, I took a pencil and sort of drew in that triangle shape where the um, stitching is going to be. See that right there? That is how you're going to stitch in the miter on the sewing machine. And that allows me to trim away all that excess fabric. You can see that in picture five to create a beautiful mitered corner that is not bulky and it lays nice and flat. Yes, this is how you hem a napkin or a tablecloth. Um, I also really like to use this at the top of shower curtains because that first grommet doesn't end up in a bulky um, spot. So um, anyway, this is a bottom hem with a mitered corner. Now I can't get my slide to go forward. There we go. 
So after I've hemmed around all the sides of the face fabric, I'm going to fold that up, set it aside, and now I can prep all the linings and inner linings. So if you remember from the cutting, we had face fabric, black sateen lining, flannel inner lining, and then an outer ivory lining. So I'm starting here with the black sateen lining and the flannel inner lining. So I'm going to take the black sateen, smooth it out over the work table, top that with the inner lining, making sure that the bottom edge is even. Again, we don't worry about the side edges too much, um, so just sort of line them up, but we didn't cut those to size yet. But the bottom we want to have even and square. And then iron it, make sure all your linings have been pre-ironed, they're nice and flat, they're sort of married together. And inner lining, flannel will kind of grab um, the other fabric. Starting from the bottom, I'm going to create pockets for the ribs. And they're not really going to be pockets, they're actually going to be channels. Um, so I'm going to channel stitch the inner lining to the black sateen. I'm going to make sure they're spaced eight inches or less on center because this is where my ribs are going to slide in for the ribbed shade. And eight inches or less um, does currently meet the cord safety standards. If you're watching this webinar a year from today, those standards may have changed. So be sure to keep up to date with um, everything that's going on in the industry with cord safety. But for right now, we're doing eight inch spacing. And you can pre-plan your spacing of the ribs based on the length. You might want to make it um, divided even or to the pattern repeat. This fabric has a really, really large pattern repeat that didn't really make any difference or, or play out beautifully. Um, so I just went with the eight inch spacing. The size of the channels that you mark depends on the size of your ribs. I'm using plastic shade ribs. They're hollow, um, a little bit larger than, let's say, a fiberglass shade rib. They're smaller than a wooden dowel or a, a wooden batten. So just, you might want to have to sew a little mock-up, a little quick sample with some scraps out of the trash can to see what size you want your channels to be. I ended up sewing a one-inch um, channel, which was quite um, generous. I could have probably gone to a three-quarter inch channel and made it a little bit tighter, but you don't want it too tight. You don't want it drawing up. So um, as you can see, I'm marking and drawing these lines all the way up the inner lining. And then pinning all the layers together down the center of the channel marks. That way I'll be able to sew without having to remove the pins. The pins are not going to be in the way of the presser foot and a machine stitch along each line and you're creating one piece with black on the back, flannel on the front, and then are all channel stitched together where all the ribs are going to go. Now it's time to add the linings and inner lining to the shade. So get back out that shade that you set aside that's all hemmed with the mitered corners and place that face down on the work table. Place the piece that you channel stitch with the bottom, at the bottom of the shade, um, lined up evenly, and then trim away the excess. Make sure it's smoothed all out. And you might wanna take a ruler and um, just double check to make sure that your channel stitching is even all the way up the shade, um, that it's not on an angle, <laughs> a little bit longer on one side than the other. Now would be a good time to make sure all that's good and square. And if you had to take it apart and re-sew it, it's okay. It's on the inside. No one will ever see it. And then trim off the sides to fit. Cut it the exact width. Now you can place the final lining piece over the back of the shade and trim that to fit the finished width and the finished length. So you do have three layers of lining, face fabric, flannel, black sateen, and then the ivory lining. Um, and this is the French blackout method. So when you hear French blackout, it's not a type of lining. It's a method of adding black fabric um, in between inner lining and your face, your lining fabric with your face fabric. You can do this in draperies. Um, it works beautifully in draperies. You can use it in valances, top treatments, swags, 
um, and in shades as an option for blackout. So I'm using the French blackout here and channel stitching it with the inner lining. And that's it. I mean, it's that simple. Now I'm going to tuck all those linings that I cut to fit the, sh the shade under the edges and then insert the ribs from one side into each of the channels. I cut the ribs one inch less than the finish width and then I'm using a flat metal weight bar in the bottom hem. This helps to keep the hem nice and square and flat. Whenever I do a spring roller shade, I really, really like to have that metal weight bar in the bottom because that's where you grab the shade is along the hem. Um, do you have to use the flat weight bar? No, <laughs> you could use um, a round weight bar, but it does make the hem a little lumpy looking. So I like the flat bar. And now um, finish all your hems. I do hand stitching. You could also use a fusible or adhesive tape. With the ribs all in the shade, you can't put it in a blind hemmer at this point. So um, I would actually really like to do the hand stitching because it's forgiving. Hand stitching is gentle and um, doesn't show from the front. And the same thing for an adhesive product wouldn't show from the front. And you don't have to take the shade off the table. So all that work you've done keeping everything nice and flat and square is not going to get distorted by taking it off the table. And as you can see, I've added a label there at the bottom of the hem. Hand stitched that on while I was going. And now it's time to mark for the rings. This is a Roman shade, so it needs to have rings to pull up the shade for the cord. And with ribs, you don't have to space it quite as close together. I think 10 to 12 inches apart. You could even go a little further if you felt like it was okay. Um, I usually pr try to keep it around 12 inches apart when I have ribs in the shade. If there's no ribs, then I want to go 9 inches or less apart um, to pull up the shade evenly. The distance to the outer rings are placed from the edge depending on what your lift system is. I'm using the Pro Lift system from Safety Shade and they recommend two and a half inches for the rings. Um, my side hems are two inches, so I just have to start those first outer rings two and a half inches from the side. I'm going to mark underneath each rib where I want the rings to be placed and then I'm going to pin it, catching the face fabric um, under each rib. And you can see that in the photo there on the left. It's pretty clear where the ribs are um, inserted. And then hand tack a ring with a good quality hand sewing thread, good heavy duty thread um, at each mark. And be sure to catch the face fabric with the stitching. And um, you'll note that these are clear plastic rings. These are the, are the forever rings from Safety Shade that comes in their kit. Um, to match the clear plastic ring locks. But if you want to use brass rings or nickel rings or you're using a different lift system and you don't want to use clear rings, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm just using um, these rings for this project. And down in the right hand corner it says, would I do this differently as I ask myself? Yes. Um, I'll share what I learned at the end of this lesson, but this is the first time I've made a shade like this. So um, there's going to be trial and error. So would I do some things differently if I made the shade again? Yes, I would. So I'll share more of that um, coming up. After all the rings are sewn, you'll measure the finished length, cut off any excess fabric, leaving enough to wrap over and staple to the top of the board. I allow two inches. Uh, depends on how much you want to allow and the size of your board. Staple the shade to the board. Make sure you finish it all nice and neat so no raw edges show and it's all covered with fabric or lining. And then because the shade system has brackets on each side that um, are pretty obvious, I added little return flaps. I don't know what else to call them. Maybe you have a better um, name for them than that. But I made them using fusible buckram and I creased them and pressed them to create this nice crisp right angle and attach them with a double-sided adhesive tape. And this is the jewel tape. You could use Sela tape or one of the other um, 
double-sided sticky tapes that are used in our industry. I really like doing it this way because it doesn't have to come over on top of the board where the shade is mounted, making a little bit bulkier or corner because you want the shade to hang nice and flat. So this can just sort of stick on afterwards. There won't be any weight on it. There'll be nothing hanging off of it. Um, so the double-sided tape will work fine. If you think it needs to be stapled, go for it. Um, staple it on. Now the shade is attached to the board. The rings are on it. It's time to attach it to the lift system and thread the shade cord through the rings and into the system. Um, this is not a presentation about the pro lift system, so to speak. I am showing it, um, but I wanted to keep this really short at about a half hour since I just planned this two days ago. <laughs> so um, be sure to visit the Safety Shade website. They have product videos and information. Um, and the resources for that are listed at the end of this presentation. And do note that the ring locks, the rings, the level locks that are used instead of orbs at the bottom, those can be used with any lift system that accepts cords. So if you want to use um, a lift system from Rolly Company or Textall or Rollies um, and use that with these ring locks and rings, you can do that. So it's interchangeable. So don't feel like you have to um, limit yourself to one system throughout the whole shade. You could also use the ring locks and um, level locks and rings with a motorized system. So that's the that part of the shade is separate from the lift system. But you can also buy these great kits that are all put together that have everything you need. So check out um, Safety Shade for more information and to see their product videos. I told you this would be short, <laughs> so my shade's finished. Um, but there was some troubleshooting with the lift system because this is the first time that I had used it for a client. So um, this shade, because it is blackout, French blackout, and a large size, it was very heavy. So the first attempt with the lift system, it squeaked. I didn't think that was normal, so I contacted Safety Shade. I sent them a little video I made on my phone of what the shade sounded like, and they wrote back and said, it should not squeak. So try this. Um, maybe your drive rod is too long. So that's true. I measured and cut my drive rod, but I didn't necessarily measure that accurately when I put the brackets on. I just stuck them on the board. So I moved the brackets out slightly and gave a little more wiggle room to the drive rod. Um, and they also suggested that I add a second support bracket. So I took the head rail, unscrewed it from the board, slid off the cones where the cords connected, and added a second support bracket. That helped. That pretty much did the job. While I was there, I added a little silicone spray um, on the drive rod where it meets the bracket, and that fixed it. So what I learned, um, which I'm hopefully save you some time if you're making a heavy shade is if you're using the system in a big shade plan to use extra brackets plan to use a little silicone spray where the drive rod meets the support bracket another thing I learned this system's really easy to take apart and put back together um, while it's all attached to your shade it really is a simple and uncomplicated system the brackets ended up being spaced about 15 inches apart, if you want to put that in your um, arsenal of tips. <laughs> so here's how the shade looks from the back. Um, pretty neat. You don't see rib pockets um, like you would in um, some other types of shades with ribs. This is how the shade looks from the front. If you get the light on it just right, you can see the, um, the ribs that are in the shade. And I'm gonna go back one slide there. I think I had another slide. Okay, so now some questions that um, I know you're going to be asking and I am going to check the questions. Um, I haven't been looking at them while I've been presenting, but Maybe these are some of your questions. 
does French blackout eliminate pinholes of light? No. Um, but the stitching areas and, and places where the rings are stitched, where the um, channel stitching is done, is more diffused if you compare it to a three-pass blackout lining. For your information, if this shade had a darker color face fabric, if it was brown or navy or a dark print, there would be less light showing. I hung this up on the work stand in front of my very, very sunny window. And you can see, if you look closely, you can see some light um, coming through. I do have a technique for making shades with black outlining with no pinholes of light. Um, and that's on my Home Deck Gal YouTube channel where this video will also be. So you can compare the two. Could you use French blackout with the technique shown in my previous webinar about eliminating pinholes of light? You bet. <laughs> but that's another shade for another day. So stay tuned because I'd like to try that too. Why should you use French blackout instead of just using one layer of three pass blackout lining, which would save time, right? Well, the French blackout method of layering all these linings does provide better insulation. And on a day like today here in North Carolina, where it's really, really cold, I can tell you that we closed every one of our shades and curtains last night um, to keep our house warm. So um, layers create insulation. It also has a softer hand and it's unique, which is a selling point to a high-end market that wants things that are maybe crafted um, with a little extra time and a little extra care. So what I learned um, in this experiment with this shade and a few things I might do differently. If I do this again, I'm going to sew the rings to the shade before the ribs are inserted into the channels. It was really difficult to stitch the rings with the rigid rib already in the shade. Now I know that there's um, Penny here today um, in the UK and a lot of um, workrooms in the UK actually hang their shades and stab stitch with the ribs in place. So this would work great for them um, but I tack my rings on the table, so it made it kind of difficult. I had to keep um, moving the shade over. I couldn't fold the shade up. It, it has had bones in it. It has ribs in it. So I would sew it on before, leave one side hem open or both side hems um, just pinned and not, not stitched, slide the ribs in after all the rings are in place. Um, French blackout did not, does not eliminate pinholes of light, so um, more of this on the, I should say, previous slide, not next slide. Um, well, actually, I think I do have something on the next slide. <laughs> Experiment with sewing pockets for the ribs. Um, I did channel stitching this time, but what if I sewed pockets in the inner lining or just the black lining? and sandwiched it all on the inside instead of doing the channel stitching. Um, I'd like to try that. I, I think that would be a really nice finish as well. And then some final thoughts. There are many, many different ways to make shades. This is just one technique which may or may not be suitable for your projects. This method may or may not be an original idea. Just because I've never seen a shade made like this, doesn't mean it's new. It doesn't mean you've made shades like this already. It's all about sharing so that we can learn together. And just a reminder to keep learning and be open-minded about new ideas and then take away what works for you. You may never make a shade like this, but one tip from this presentation might be helpful to you on a future project. So if you're um, sitting there now saying, I am never going to spend the time to channel stitch black lining to flannel, well, maybe you've learned another tip in the uh, presentation today that will help you with your shades. And let's keep the conversation going. Stay in touch. Brainstorming and experimenting is fun. It's um, probably my favorite thing um, to do and thank goodness for social media and email where we can um, keep talking about these things and maybe you'll try this for a sample and learn something new please share that with me um, and 
uh, share it on um, our Facebook groups and uh, would love, love to hear from you. So now I'm going to look at um, the questions and thank you and um, great. I'm glad to see that Judy made it here. I didn't think that she would um, find her way, but it, it is a miracle, Judy, and welcome. Um, and Jean is uh, commenting about how neat and clean the back looks. And that's why I wanted to try this method because I didn't like the way that um, when I did rib shades and I stitched all those pockets, I didn't always like the way that looked. And a take up allowance for the channel stitching. Cindy, that's a great question and I should have addressed that. That's why I did not cut the linings and um, inner lining, the black lining and inner lining to the exact size because there is going to be take up and a little distortion when you're sewing all those channels. So that's why I wait and trimmed it um, after it was all sewn. So I would allow at least an inch on each side if you are going to um, cut your linings to a size. Um, and Francis, I don't see all of your question. Oh, no, there it is. Um, I only see part of your question. And you're welcome. P folks are saying thank you. And um, Penny, my dog Dee Dee, is doing very well. She had surgery this week and um, she's doing great, but she still has a lampshade on her head. And, um, and for those of you that are joining a hangout for the first time, what did you think? It wasn't so hard. Um, and you can always view this again on the YouTube channel. Um, Ruth, to stitch the channels for the dowels, I just used a regular straight stitch presser foot. Nothing fancy, nothing different. If you find there's take up, um, a rolling foot or using a walking foot would be a really great idea. And um, I use scissors instead of, um, there's a question about using a rotary cutter. Um, I would need a mat on my table to use um, a rotary cutter. I do have an electric pair of shears that I use for like upholstery weight fabrics and things, but um, almost always use scissors. And, um, and yes, when you hand sew the rings, you do catch the face fabric. Um, that's to make sure that the face fabric is lifted with the shade. And um, before, I need to go to the next slide to show the resources. How long did it take me to fabricate the shade? <laughs> That's a really great question and I don't have an answer to it because when I'm doing something new and I'm sort of cataloging the steps, taking photos, writing notes, I don't get a really good sense of how long something would take. Um, I could estimate and maybe that's something um, I should make up. Since this is going to someone's home, I'd like to make a sample um, for class samples. And um, I can measure my time and see how long it takes. And a tip for carrying the inner lining fabrics to the machine for the easiest sewing. Pin it really, really well. That's why I had all those pins down each channel. Um, that seemed to work fine and inner lining sort of marries well to the fabric so it did okay and don't cut all your fabrics to the exact size so that you can trim them off um, if you got a little if it grows a little bit or it moved a little bit um, and Susan do you think you could sew the ring around the rib yes you could sew the ring around the rib I'd probably want to use a smaller size um, rib for that. That would be, I'd like to see that done. So um, Penny, maybe you can make a sample for me <laughs> and share it with me later. <laughs> and um, another question about a product. So let's go to the next slide. Um, on the slide you're seeing on your screen now, if you like this free presentation that was um, just a little tidbit, a little bit of what I show when I do my Home Deck Gal webinars, um, then you might want to sign up for the next webinar, which is going to be Draperies with Pleats and Grommets. And that is 
later this month, Tuesday the 20th. The cost is $45. That does include step-by-step -step handouts for all the class projects, and you'll have access to the recording. So um, it's sort of like buying a pattern but you get more <laughs> and you get me because you can always write to me and ask me questions and if you attend the live presentation you can ask questions during the class um, to find the registration link for the upcoming webinar you can go to the events area on my facebook page you can go to my blog on my website or you can email me at susan at homedebtgal.com and if you want to check out some of the past DVDs, webinars, and recordings and handouts, they're also on my website for purchase. And I have classes on craftsy.com, plus more free videos and webinars like this one on the Home Deck Gal YouTube channel. So here's a list of resources from this class. And I still have questions coming in, so. Um, just want to check those. And if you have any questions about the resources, um, the adhesive tape is from DonnaScoofus.com and that's called Jewel Tape, J-E-W-E-L. And if you get in touch with Donna, tell her I said hello. And um, the Haynes linings are at Drapery dash linings.com and I use the classic sateen. You can also get the black lining in Ruby Plus if you want a lighter weight lining. The fabric came from Mary Jo's cloth store. The lift system kit you can purchase from safetyshade.com or from safetyshaderinglocks.com and if you go to safetyshaderinglocks.com that would be Sharon and tell her that I said hello. <laughs> The shade ribs and lift cord um, were from Textall. The staple gun and staples I used were from Rolly Company. Hand sewing needles and thread from Wawak.com. And the weight bar and the board I purchased locally from Lowe's. So if you're looking for the flat weight bar, go in the department that has the um, threaded rod and aluminum bars and aluminum, aluminum rods and you'll find steel and aluminum and all kinds of bars. Um, you don't want to buy the rusty steel one. You want to get the ones that are coated or aluminum to use in the bottom of your shades. And then if you do own a workroom business and you're on Google Plus or you'd like to join Google Plus, I invite you to join the Window Treatment and Upholstery Workrooms community. There's no charge. It's just a um, community where we all can sort of group together and share. So um, take a chance to, to look at that and check that out. And I thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for your comments and questions and um, kind, kind, kind comments. I really appreciate it. I am going to have another free presentation much like this next month. February 26th and um, I'll also be sharing an exciting new project I'm working on so I can't I can't share it yet but um, you don't want to miss it if you want to be the first to know about it plan to join me at noon on February 26th it's a Thursday so um, go over and um, follow the Home Deck Gal page on Facebook so that you can be kept up to date so thanks so much I really really um, appreciate you being here today let me come back up so I can tell you goodbye and I hope to see you back on Facebook um, or email me if you have questions about this technique and if you experiment with it please share um, I'd love to hear from you so have a great day and have a great weekend everybody I'll talk to you soon take care bye